Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul, Angeline, and today we're talking about world building help. World building help. Well, somebody on Reddit asked about it was a brand new to world building, and they wanted to world build, right? And he was asking for advice and manuals that people knew about or advice they had about world building on where to start. Can I give my advice? I know what your advice is. My advice is why. That's not advice. World That's build. a question. There's so many worlds already built. <laughs> we'll go into that a little bit later. He was asking for advice and he was talking about books, manuals, and even just general advice on what to do and how to do it. Because he's really intent on doing it. So don't try to convince him that he shouldn't do it. I wasn't going to. Oh. Uh, that was just my, my question in general for people because I always hear, hear people talking about world building and all the different things that go into it yeah he was generally asking where he should start how much he should do those kind of big general questions and i thought i was thinking about it i go well where do you start right i mean you could start small big create the world name your world i think his specific question was home brewing a world or yeah no world building how to make the world how do you make the world that you're going to play in He's going to run because he's a GM. So if you feel the need to make a world because you're not happy with whatever world you're playing in currently. Right. Then, okay. So you got to start somewhere. And I think uh, uh, the first thing I think it depends on the game, right? Uh, I was thinking about how different games need different types of world building. For example, uh, some games need a lot. Let's say, for example, D&D 5th Edition or champions or hero hero games because a lot of it depends on the GM knowing what's out there for the characters to encounter right like what's going on in the world sort of sort of thing and so they they're, they're going to be they're going to have to do a little bit more world building to be able to run that campaign so they're going to need to do world building yeah. to run the campaign a little bit more than than and let's say, for example, you have D and D game, right? If you want a world build in a world like, so you're, so you're saying that if you're running a fifth edition game, but you don't like, what's the what's Forgotten Realms? Forgotten Realms, and you don't want to switch to one of the other worlds that, that, yeah, that have already lot, been built. There's a lot of worlds out there, but you have to come up with all the information. No, you don't. Who's in the world? Well, not all the information, you don't have to build the world, but you should have something built or something in mind as to where the characters are going to be, where they can explore, where they, what they're going to find in different places. So, see, I wouldn't want, I, I, I would take a really uh, easy route there and go, okay, Waterdeep. This is, the city isn't called Waterdeep, it's called something else, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you really have a problem with people. I really have a problem with building. the with the world building thing because there's so many things already built. But I understand. So so you're saying they have to come up with the cities, the terrains, right? Where the or where this or make a map, right? Or where they're gonna explore, or what they're gonna do, and because it's combat combat heavy, like hero games, hero games are combat heavy. D and D's combat heavy. You gotta have things for them to fight or encounters for them to fight along the way. Even if you're, even if your D and D game is mainly about exploring or about community building or whatever it is, sooner or later combat is going to get involved because it's centered around combat. So in those kind of games, you're going to need stuff for them to do stuff to them for the players to go against. But that's, that's normal, right? There's, when you're creating your your campaign or your or your one shot game, there's going to be you're coming up with a, who they're gonna what they're doing or giving them something to do, right? Right. Usually there's encounters, right? If yeah. you look at most campaigns or adventures published, you'll find that there's encounters in every book. There's right. No doubt, doubt about it. That's all there. That's not. That's all there is. That's not really world building, right? The world building part is the where the cities are, where the yeah. what the gods are, 
what the peoples right. are. Right, right. And because of that, because it's D and D, and it's because it's combat heavy, and people tend to move around, then you have to do a little bit of world building. If we were playing, uh, let, me, let me see, uh, Pride and Prejudice game, right? Uh, let's say a Jane Austen game, where everything takes place in a manner. There's not a whole lot of world building going on. Although you would need to have the the city and the Do you? Uh, yeah, you have to have a because they have to leave the manor. They can't just stay in the manor the whole time. They might sure. want to go to town. Yeah, but the, it, it, but the town could be. Well, uh, you would just cu- you would use the name of whatever town you're setting your manor next yeah. to, right? Which would involve taking a map of of England and picking something or. Making your own town. Well, I mean, you could use the yeah, you could use real places. You couldn't call it Jane Austen a Jane Austen thing unless you were. I mean, you could say it's Jane Austen like. Okay. If you don't pick a a town, that's what I'm saying. In the Jane, Jane Austen city or system or books. Right. Or, or Jane Austen inspired role playing game. Okay, so you would need the, the manor where things take place. Maybe the city. Uh, maybe a large area where a ball takes place, but usually that takes place in a manor too, right? Or some rich person's huge house. Well, see, that's the thing. If they might be giving the ball, but then maybe so and so on their estate is giving the ball, so you have to. Have oh yeah, that. yeah. You I have mean. a. They'll have a picnic or something or a yeah whatever a day outside. I don't know what they do in Jane Austen novels. But uh, but I'm Same learning. thing in the Bridgerton novels yes. that, or Bridgerton series that you're watching. Right, right. And that's what I got. Is if you have, if you play a lighter game, let's say Tales from the Loop, there's a lot less world building, right? You don't need to create. All you need to create in that sense is just a, a town, a loop, and where the loop to, is, the loop. But is that world building? No, but it is, sort of. It's the world that the players are, are going to be playing in. So in Tales from the Loop, its setting is uh, is what Sweden. The natural setting is there's a in the book there's a, a town in Sweden mm-hmm. and there's a Nevada city. Nevada city, which is in Nevada, in Nevada or yeah, yeah. Well, Nevada city is technically in California, but I'm, well, okay, maybe I I, don't, I have no idea. I anyway, so when you ran it, you just switched it to Monterey. Yes, because I but know- that's not really. I might be confused on the term world building. The world that you're going to play in. Because you're playing this, the, the Tales from the Loop game. Yes. And you're using that world, but you just switched it to a different city. So that's not really world building. That's just placing it in a different place. And I'm not sure that I'm not sure what we're talking about if, if you're saying that's world building. Well, world building is, is uh, creating the, the area that the players are going to be play in. Okay. So because... In Tales of the Loop, you're playing kids, and you don't normally travel 60 miles to the big city. You could, but usually it's not very likely. Everything takes place in the little town or the small city that you reside in, and you solve mysteries, and that's what you do. And so you don't need to create this world, the whole world. You don't have to create a whole continent. In in this Tales of the Loop, you don't have to even create the state. You just create... Or imagine, reimagine a town and that has a loop, and and then you got to figure out well, what is the loop going to do to that town, or how's the town going to function? Other than the way, if you're using a real town, like let's say I use my hometown or the county of Monterey because the loop was really large, and I wanted to include uh, Salinas and I want to include Monterey, but what I did was I made the I made those locations a little bit closer together, so the kids could actually travel from Monterey to Salinas and like. Moss Landing, and it wouldn't be such a arduous task. Like it would take, I mean, if you were to bike from Salinas to Monterey on a bicycle, it probably take you quite a while, right? Or to from uh, Salinas to Watsonville or to Moss Landing. So I made it, I made it a little bit smaller. You know, all those one, I made the town smaller, less population, and I made the. I made it kind of squished together the county so everything was close together. So it was indeed possible for you to bike from Salinas to Monterey in, let's say, just a couple hours. Okay. So th- that, to me, is world building, right? That, to me, is is changing. Uh, even if you're using a real wor- real pl- real place, you're changing the environment to suit the game. Now, if that was, if I was going to use, let's say, 
the Monterey County for a a, a uh, shadow run game, I wouldn't even have to move the the, the move move the the towns or the too close together because people have cars and people have they could probably have planes. Heck, some some uh, street samurai could probably run faster enough to than a car from one town to another. And they would probably they may leave that area, so they would have to world build more. Like, what's what's the next city over? What's the next big city over? But in a game like Shadowrun, you don't really have to to world build anything because they have all different kinds of cities you can you can go from Seattle to Chicago. Well, yeah, it and, as, yeah, you're right. Shadowrun does has its own. And you can go to world. yeah. So you don't need Shadowrun. It would be really hard to world build. Okay, right? so let's let, let's let's eliminate the world. The nickname Shadowrun. How about? Uh, I'm fine. I'm just telling you that I, I don't think you need to do it. I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but I don't think you have to do it. That's all. Because there's so many, so much, so much stuff already written for that. But if there wasn't stuff already written, or you didn't like what it was written, that's why I reason. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I'm okay. just, I'm just. And then C, I put down like Dresden Files, or the original Dresden Files, a two book set, where you actually build the city that you're gonna play in with the players. Like, well, we never. We, we never did that when when you well because I knew you guys weren't into world building right so city building in this case you gave us a city that we knew right and then I just changed things a little bit again I did world build a little bit again I made I made the towns a little bit closer together so there wasn't be so much lag time uh, between specifically Monterey and Salinas Monterey and Salinas are about twenty five minutes away from each other depending on traffic <laughs> but I made them like ten miles away from each other so it would be closer to to go from one place to another just for expediency. And then the quiet year is exactly the same thing. In that case, it's almost a, it is a GM list game where people make a, a map of their community and what's like, this is where our settlement is. What's next to the settlement? What's the east? What's the north? What's the west? And then you make the world together. That's literally a game where you're world building together. Yes. And you, and everybody, and it's, but it's a very small area you're world building. You're only worried about your community and what's around it. Yeah, you're not worried about the continent over, or you know about because you're not going to go anywhere. You're not so you don't have to come up with a history. Well, you might come up with a history, but it, it it doesn't matter in that game. You're just worried about the next year you're trying to live. Yes, but I was saying you don't have to come up with a history because you're talking about world building. Yes, yes. So there's different games, and there's I think there's different there's different needs of world building for AGM to do depend on the game. I know you're still not convinced of why people do it, but Trust me, there's plenty of people who do it. So actual books and manuals on world building. There's one called The Ultimate RPG GM's World Building Guide. Now, this is by James D'Amato. It's it's really well written, right? And what it does, it gives you, it starts off very small. It talks about prompts and stuff like that. And this book is pretty good because it, talk, it covers everything, like every not every genre, but the main genres, like science fiction, fantasy, cyberpunk right so it covers big swaths of games that people play very popular ones and you know this is a pretty good pretty hefty book at 272 pages and what it does it gives you prompts like what kind of adventures are you going to run in your world and so you answer these questions and when you answer these questions you're actually world building your world so by the time you go through most of the book you've already created a world that you want your players to play in so I think it's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, it's available on. It's a real book. You go to Barnes and Noble, buy the book. I'm not sure if it's available as a PDF. You might want to check if it's actually at Barnes and Noble before you go. Huh. Well, I, I know it's available on Amazon, and it's a real book. Like it's not an ebook. Then it's probably available on BarnesandNoble.com yeah. too. Right. Or I other books. I mean, other I, mean I think, I, and it's a series of books. You know, the Ultimate Guide for RPGs. There's the Ultimate Guide to making maps and, and stuff like that. And I have seen those at Barnes and Noble. So. So there you go. So this is pretty good if you're specifically doing something for a real guide, a real manual on world building. Another uh, set of books, I think this is more like a set of books, is done by Expeditions Retreat, which I know these books are are on Drive Through RPG because Expeditions Retreat is a, a small publisher, and but I'm sure they have, they may have a P P O D or print on demand. I'm not sure, but I know they have the the PDFs. And these are like a series of books. It's not just one book. So there's world building 
and it's broken up into like Western Europe, uh, the ecology and society, and the Silk Road. So like the ecology and society talks about geography, about stuff like that in world building, cultural and how to societies form and how you would do that in your game that you want to build. It seems like a lot of work. Yeah. And then, of course, there's they have the Western Europe, which is basically uh, a medieval world, much like Western Europe. And uh, the typical, atypical fantasy type of uh, setting. Now, this is written for 3.xx. It was mainly written for 3.xx D&D. Now, 3.xx is 3.0 to 3.5. And you could probably throw Pathfinder in there. I mean, Pathfinder. Everybody first, does. First edition Pathfinder is like, they call it jokingly 3.75. I've looked at the world building Western Europe, and you could use it. I mean, there's rules. Uh, there's some rules in it about D and D third edition, but for the most part, you could still use it for any kind of world building of of a medieval Western world, European world. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. Expedition Retreats is they're really good at writing. I really like it. I really like that one book. I haven't read the other ones, but like the Silk Road is about travel routes and how that influences society. So I think that's pretty interesting. You mean all roads lead to lead to Rome? Well, I think the Silk Road refers to like the Spice Road yes, in, I know. in India or something like that. Uh, I don't know too much about that uh, that part of history. The writers in this book talk about how that might influence the town that you put around this, uh, on these trade routes. Very interesting, uh, I, it seems to me. But I, like I said, I don't have any time to world build myself. So I, I just got the first book on PDF and it's pretty cool. Did you read it? Or did you just just? I remember I got it. I I got it as a. I think I got it as a charity bundle, and so I got the you know I got the book and then I looked at I looked at it. I didn't like read through it the whole thing, but when I was doing this, I looked at it a little bit more. It was pretty good. It's a pretty good book. Re- pretty well written. The next is, Felix Games. Now this guy is by uh, this guy. This uh these set of books is by Phil McGregor, and I kickstarted the. The series of books that he that he did, and but he his idea is a real or realistic fantasy world, low low magic of course, but he wanted to be real. If he wanted a realistic one, and the first book is called Orb, Orb, Orbis Mundi Two. Well, he has the first book, but he redid it did it again, and it's called Orbis Mundi Two. It's a fantasy Europe. And he has another book is Fantasy Europe, and then another book is called The Marketplace. And what it really does is a good job of the historical, it gives you historical information about medieval Europe, uh, how things actually worked. Now, it really gets in the weeds, right? It talks about manners and how manners were supported, and it talks about the... So it was what I studied to get my master's degree <laughs> in, in history. <laughs> monetization and how monetization worked and how medieval Europe actually worked, how, how you couldn't have a business or you couldn't have a farm unless the king or the duke granted you a writ to be able to do that stuff. And everything had to have a contract because that's just the way things were. And how you were didn't own anything but were given permission to do things by the Lord and blah, blah, blah. And and it could, like I said, it could get deep in the woods and with details. I think if you're going to build a fantasy world, I think this kind of stuff you might want to look at and take a look and see how things really worked instead of just hand-waving things like, well, gold grows on trees, so you don't have to worry about how finding gold mine might change the economy. I was just going to say, isn't there a game called Pendragon that does that, but they play fast and lose with history because it's an Arthurian? Well, remember, uh, uh, Pendragon deals with... Uh, Arthurian legend. Yeah, but a specific, specific along the lines of uh, called the, the the death of Arthur. He was uh, what? Jeez, I forgot his name. It's based on that fantasy uh, mold. Other yes. people have written about about uh, King Arthur, but in this case, it's definitely about oh, Sir Thomas Mallory. That's yeah, what it is. So Thomas Mallory. Yeah. So in Sir Thomas Sir Thomas Mallory's book, he doesn't really care about money. So in Pendragon. You don't care about money, right? You're you are a knight, and you... that's what I, I'm saying. It, it's based on medieval stuff. Yes, but they play a little fast. Oh, fast with, with, his, with the with the actual yes, history. Yes, yeah, exactly. Which always freaks me out, but I understand. Right, and then I have another a book. Now this one is kind of comes at uh, world building from a different angle because it's for writers. So this book is really a workbook. It's called. 
The other book that you were yeah, talking yeah. about is? The next book is called The Only World Building Book You Will Ever Need. <laughs> it's written, I forget who the writer is, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lady who deals with book writing for scripts, uh, that kind of writing, not necessarily for RPGs. But I thought it was interesting because the book is an actual workbook. It has like a prompt and it says write something and it literally gives you pages, page, not pages, but lines to write in. And it, and it asks you to describe stuff and it gives you just page a page that you can just write stuff into this work. It literally is like the old, old grammar school workbook where you write in this book. And at the end of the, uh, at the end of the book, you have built a world with different elements of what you need for writing and which is basically what you're doing when you a when you are world building for a fantasy game or a a role playing game okay so, so i thought it was interesting i thought it, it i thought when i got the pdf it, it asked questions that other games don't like it may seem unnecessary because they're really trying to get into character development and how that might influence the characters and what would influence the characters and stuff like that of your novel or screenplay and i thought it was just a different angles to come from than the other manuals that I saw out there about world building for RPGs. Okay. It, it, it clocks in at 172 pages, so like 100 pages less than the than the ultimate guide. But I thought it was pretty good. I mean, This one is the only guide? The only one, only one you will ever need. I see. Which I know, I know sounds kind of presumptuous, but there's a lot of space in there for you to write your ideas in, and I think that is kind of important. That way... You have this book. It looks like a book. I mean, it looks, uh, it's, it's a book that you write in. And so you, once you finish, there's, it's there. And you won't have, you know, sometimes people write in notebooks. I know you like, probably uh, already know this, Saul, but for writers, that's prompts are like what they, what they live with, right? They, there's all kinds of books that give them prompts to help you no, with I your. I didn't know that. Yeah. I've never written a book, so I don't know. I never tried. You, when you took English in, in college, did you, no. did it? English in college. I never took English in college. Whatever. Did I take English in college? I must have, right? You had to. I know you took one at San Jose State. An English class? Yeah. No. Oh, uh, well, no, I took a... No, no, no. I took... What was it? Oh, yeah, English 100 or something? Yeah, everybody had to. Yeah, but that was just... That, that one just told me how to use a library. <laughs> Seriously, that's what it was about. It was about other things too. No, you just it, weren't paying attention. No, no, no. This was all about how. To, and let me tell you, this, this, in the old days, that was the old days too, when you had to go and figure out how to use a microfiche machine. And, and we, we still had a card card catalog. No, they were they were switching to yes. they, they 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 had the card catalog, but they didn't use it. Anymore. Oh, that's true. You're right, and she was very mad about that. <laughs> She was extremely mad about it, and what and what I'm was, sure she used Arabian styles. Uh, yes, well, yes, but but what was interesting is, I mean, I understand. You know, she seemed kind of like a luddite if you think about it. Like, she was really upset that they were going from the from the card catalog to the online. Yes, that was that's right. It sounds like state 1994, 1995. They had gotten rid of the card catalog and gone to the online one, and I can imagine these ugly. Big monitors. We had this beautiful card catalog, and uh, what's funny was is that she, she this is how this is how deep she really re- didn't like the idea of switching to the online catalog was that she went and found uh, five of her favorite books, and she took the cards out of it and she kept them in her pocket. That was a, to help teach you before they got rid of the cards. Yeah, but I, I thought it was very before all, everything went online. Me and my class, we what I meant by my class, her work, you know, her her questions, and we had to do stuff, right? Find this, find that. Let me tell you, after that class, though, I could go to any library and research and find anything on anything that I on that I needed to find because she was. Which uh, is why the class was there. So this yes. book about about English prompts, which was what we were talking yes, about, English prompts. They have that. The there's all kinds of books like that. For if you want to write, be a creative writer, if you're trying to write a nonfiction, they give you the prompts to tell you what to do. So that book, this is the only book that you'll ever need, right. is the way that, that a lot of uh, writers, prompts help them to go with their stuff, to figure out what they're writing, right? Right, to, to spark the elements of... Not only that, but to have them practice. Right, 
Which I didn't know. I don't know. I've never dared write. And I did your, take your a- idea about about that from that book about oh, asking questions. Yeah. When I was looking up this topic on this one, I found there was this one guy on Reddit talking about how you should always ask why for everything that you want to put into your world. Uh-huh. If you want to have orcs in your world, why do you want orcs in your world? Yes. I'm like, going. I think the in my brain I'm thinking, well, the more appropriate question is where are the orcs <laughs> and do they why do you need a history for them and all that kind of stuff if you want to world build it which i'm i don't know if my definition of world building is the same as yours but that seems like a lot of work at the very end of the, the all my notes here i have why world build that was my question uh, well, it's jolene's question and she says she would never do it because there's a hundred already made ready to Put in your. There's already game, so many worlds to put into your game system and and run. And I think I was talking to Jolene here last night, and uh, and our friend is staying here, and he was saying creativity, right? That was what he said, and I think that's true. There's, I think there's three reasons. You could probably there's probably more, but I mean I know there's more. But creativity one one that they just want to create something, and they want to. Just do it. Like almost every GM that I know has had the toyed with the possibility of creating their own world simply because for whatever reason, Faroon, Greyhawk, the planet Mars, whatever, just doesn't do or fit or work for them as far as a play setting for their game. So they world build, right? So they want to create the world, whether it's a universe, whether it's a solar system, whatever. So I think that's just an element of a RPG game master's desire to be a writer. Desire to be a writer and just want to create something that oh, this is mine. This is my own stuff. Well, just so you know, as you're creating each campaign, unless you're taking it out of a book, which obviously if you're considering that you want to be creative, you wouldn't be doing that. You would be, be being creative. So there you go. Second, I think it's control, right? Because if there's a world out there, like let's say Forgotten Realms, I'm running the game of Forgotten Realms. Now this one I, I, can, I can see. The person doesn't like the way that certain races or or peoples in the world, orcs, say for they they want you to like the orcs or something, right? They don't like they don't like the the fact that the orcs are the bad guys, right? They want to change it. Well, there's that, but there's also like uh levels of of, of knowledge, right? There's like you have you're you put in Forgotten Realms and I say, Oh, you know, I'm gonna you start on in Comir, but you end up in Waterdeep. And maybe I haven't read about Waterdeep that much, right? But somebody else has read novels about Waterdeep, has read the actual, has a Waterdeep setting campaign guide and all this other stuff. And I, and I as GM, say, well, uh, blah, 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 I, something important. Well, that's somebody, not the way that it is Exactly. Waterdeep. Somebody goes, oh, hold on. That dock is not near that inn because in blah, 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 it says that it, this is where it really is. And, and there, you get these people who will challenge you as to where your where you put your in or your if there's a guild of thieves or if there's a guild of uh, blacksmiths or whatever and that could be frustrating and i know people can easily solve this by saying well that's normal water deep but this is my water deep and you can make those kind of things don't assume that whatever is written down is whatever i'm going with but to avoid all that, an easy way is just to make your own world. And or just can. get a map of Waterdeep out of a book and say, "This is the this is the Waterdeep we're using." Well, or just just or if you change something in the past or something like certain characters that that may or may not exist at the time, or whatever. But there's always going to be some player. There's always going to be some. Well, in Waterdeep too, because the Lords of Waterdeep are secret. It's. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? You can make your water deep however you yeah, want. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they're, uh, they, maybe that was a mistake. You maybe know, like, you just wink at the player and say, you know. But what I'm saying is to avoid that. A lot of GMs don't like that. They don't like to be challenged about knowledge about the world, especially if a player has more knowledge than than you, and you, that sucks. I can see that the, I uh, well. You shouldn't worry about it, right? You shouldn't. But you shouldn't worry about it, but if, if it really bothers you, 
then I mean, you could have the talk with all the players saying, "Well, this is Forgotten Realms. I know some of you really know Forgotten Realms, and if I make them something that's different, this is my Forgotten Realms." Blah blah blah. Yeah, but still, there's gonna be. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Because like in the real Forgotten Realms, well, then this is one. The player shouldn't <coughs> be doing that. We've talked about this before. That what you do it outside of the game or something, right? Well, the players, you know, sometimes they get. And they forget about the the social contract. Well, I think that's a silly a silly reason to world build because you're upset that the players have different knowledge or or want to use their knowledge against you. Or or let's say let's say you don't want players knowing about stuff because that character wouldn't know stuff, and and players sometimes have a difficulty separating player knowledge from character knowledge. And and so you could just say. Does your character know that, or are you bringing that in from your brain? Yeah, it's so much easier just to recreate your own world, and that where the player have no clue as to what's going on, except what you tell them. Okay, if you say so. Next is possible publication. Now, every oh, GM, a creative player out there, thinks that, wow, I'm so smart, I'm so creative, that I could possibly publish this adventure, this world. Uh, and I think in the back of their minds, people think, well, if I could just hone it down or, or get, get an editor, edit this, give it to my wife so she can read it over. And Don't give it. it to your wife, <laughs> please. <laughs> or brother or whatever. Just read this little adventure. What do you think about my idea for this city, for this setting? Everybody has, has somebody in their life who can be their editor. I When I did my my master's thesis i had my brother and he did it and he was hard on me but that's what you need when you have an editor so just if you're if you're planning on doing that know that they're gonna say this is wrong why did you put this here terrible things about your writing they're gonna tell the yeah but that's what an editor is for so you can't take it personally so all of you creative people out there who want to build your own world if you're planning on publishing it definitely get an editor well, my editor would never do that to me. Oh, yeah, he would. Bay, you're never, you're not allowed to do that to me. <laughs> Just say no, Bay. <laughs> he's already said it. he's my editor for life. I don't uh, believe he said that at yeah, all. I think he did, and he's free. By the way. I don't, I don't believe that either. <laughs> anyway, so I think that's pop, possibly a, a reason for people to want to write things down and build their own world or build their own setting. And now with the, with the, in the age of self-publication with uh, print on demand and different places like drive through RPG and Lulu being able to send them your PDF and they'll make it into a book and they could put it on their website and you can try to sell it. I think it's very viable that that is also a reason why people want to world build. Just is. I mean, uh, you laugh, but I, I'm only laughing because I, Saul has portrayed me, and I may have portrayed myself as not Maybe? not coming off as a fan of world building. <laughs> You're not a fan of world building. But you would. The reason I'm not a fan of world building right. is I think it's a lot of work. Well, and yes, yes. Since there's other stuff out there, and I do a lot of things. If I'm going to run a game, I don't need the pressure to create the world too. I'm just going to pick something that I already have. Yeah, that is definitely an easier thing to do, and there's no doubt about that. I understand people like to do it, and I, I can see the creativity and stuff, but I don't. I just want to make sure that everyone understands if that's your thing, go for it. It's just not my personal thing. So Felipe made his own world. He called it Cardoza. Yeah. And we played in that AD&D for years and years. And he, we at the time, or he at the time, had the world of Greyhawk available. We could ask. We should ask him why he decided to make his own world. You can ask him all you want. I'm sure he'll tell you. <laughs> and why he decided. But I think everybody, like like I said, most GMs or most people who have been playing role playing games, they want they get that itch to create something. Well, that's why the they create campaigns. Possibility of maybe one day being a writer and getting it published. And now, like I said, with the event of self publishing and and. Mm -hmm different places you can actually you can make your dreams come true jolene so hopefully Real. saul has inspired you <laughs> to or not to it's up to you uh, get, get some help so there you go this is gaming perspectives with saul and jolene and you have a good day mm -hmm.